Good morning, church. It's good to be with you. If it's your first time here, welcome. My name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors. I'm delighted you decided to, to come gather to worship God with us. I always want to put before us why we gather. We don't gather to earn any sort of merit before God. We don't gather to check off our you know, religious duty, something along those lines. We gather to worship God. And all of this is an expression of that worship. So when we sing songs, the reason why we're singing songs is to worship God, to show our gratitude and to show his, his worthiness. And the reason why we gather around a sermon is not just to get something from the sermon. That's a, a, a measure of it. But really, as we gather as the people of God, this is an act of worship. What we're saying is we believe, God, that your word is true, and we believe your, your word is, is worthy of being listened to and, and applied. And so we will take it, we will apply it, but our application of it is ultimately an expression of our worship of God. We're declaring his worthiness. We're declaring his greatness. So I always want to put the purpose in front of us because it's super easy, super easy as the people of God to get into autopilot. And I really want to push against that as much as I can. We are not about being an autopilot. We are about growing and transforming into the image of Christ. So that's what we're all about here. If it's your first time here, welcome. If you have a Bible, let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1. Are we there? Cool. I'll pray. Oh, God. We enter into this time of reading and reflecting and seeking to apply your word. Would you please do in the hearts and minds of everyone here, including myself, would you please do what I cannot do? Holy Spirit, I can't change the mind. I can't change the heart. That is your business. Please do it. We need it. Oh, I need it. Please give it. In your name we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I will read. And it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Love this verse. Some of the most popular verses in the Bible are oftentimes some of the verses that are most taken for granted. What I mean by that is that the verses that are super popular tend to be, not always, but tend to be the verses that you don't always see lived out. Now, I don't want to be self-righteous about this, but if we could remove the self-righteousness from it, I think there's a, there's a, real, a real point here. For example, Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39, very popular verse, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you've been in church, you've heard that verse, but how often do you come across someone who you think or you feel is really pursuing that? Again, if if we can remove the self-righteousness and just stay with me for a moment. How often do you come across someone who or it comes to your mind, man, that person seems to be seeking to love God with all their heart and with all their soul and with all their mind, and with all their strength, and that person seeking to love their neighbor as themselves, to love their neighbor to the same degree that they love their self. How often does that thought come to your mind? Probably, I mean, probably here and there, but it's, it's probably not a super prevalent thought that comes to your mind. Well, a verse that's super popular isn't a verse that you tend to experience, or see, I'll give you another example. Uh, what is it, Matthew, somewhere in Matthew, Jesus says, It's easier, he says, it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Jesus is not talking, he's not saying it's sinful to be rich. But what he's saying is he's he's highlighting the dangers and temptations that come with riches. That riches, if you love money, it has the ability to, to actually pull you away from God. Very popular verse. But how often do you actually think in those ways? How often do you, if, if a raise, someone's going to give you a $100,000 raise, 
who's actually praying about that, right? He's just taking it. Even though Jesus says, hey, just be cautious of what money can do, how often do we really look at money in these ways? Again, not that it's bad to take a raise. I want you to hear what I'm saying. What I'm trying to get us to see is that the things that the scripture says that are super common, we don't, they, don't, they don't always translate into our, our life and our, our thoughts and our, our feelings, so to speak. And I believe that this verse is, is one of those. Do not conform to the pattern of this word. I want to I I I unpack this today. And as we unpack it, we're going to bring application to, to how this connects to life in the spirit. So if you don't mind, go back to verse 1, please. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Let's unpack it together. This is written by a man named Paul, and he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. In your notes, in your bulletin, you should have this verse at the top. I want to encourage you to underline, in view of God's mercy. Underline that. Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. What Paul is doing, he's referring to the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans here. The first 11 chapters of Romans are all about the mercy of God. If you don't know, or if you're not aware, I want you to know that God is merciful. Hmm. Not just merciful, God is abundantly, overwhelmingly, exceedingly, downright, ridiculously merciful to mankind. When we were dead because of God's mercy, he made us alive. When we were lost, he found us. When we were broken, he made us whole. When we were on our road to hell, he redirected us and put us on the road to heaven. This is the mercy of God because he sent Christ to the cross to remove the penalty of our sin. Because of our sin, meaning because of our selfish self-centered, self-exalting inclinations that all of us have. We were separated, we are separated from God because of who we are internally. We are, we are disconnected from God. And when you're disconnected from God, all those ills and evils come with it. So when you're disconnected from God, you're broken because God is the only true source of wholeness. And when you're disconnected from God, you're spiritually dead because God is the only source of spiritual life. And when God sent Christ to the cross, he paid the debt of your sin. He removed the sin that was within you. And you could receive that forgiveness through faith, meaning through surrender, meaning through trusting that Jesus' death on the cross paid for your sin, you can now be, listen, reconciled or reconnected back to God because your sin has been dealt with. This is the gospel. This is the good news that this proclaims, that you're disconnected from God because of your sin, but because of his love for you, he provided a way for you to be reconnected to him and experience the life that is truly life through faith in Christ. So when the scripture says, in view of God's mercy, it's saying, in view of the gospel, in view of what God has done for you, through Christ on the cross, you are to, go back to it, what does it say? Tell me. What's the response? Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Everyone say, offer your body as a living sacrifice. Okay, circle that in your notes. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is the proper response to God's mercy. This is your part. Because of what God has done for you, this is what you are supposed to do in response. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. This is the essence of the Christian life. This is what the Christian life is all about. To be a Christian is to be a living sacrifice. And there's an intentional oxymoron there. There's an intention, I don't know if oxymoron is the proper word. Yeah, an oxymoron, right? There's an, it's a, it's an intentional contrast. Living sacrifice. Sacrifice. Those two things don't go together. A sacrifice is something that's dead. But yet Paul says you're supposed to be a living sacrifice. So what he's saying is that if you're a Christian, you are dead even as you're alive. What does that mean? It means you're dead to doing it your way. 
You're dead to yourself. You're dead to your sinful inclinations. You're dead to your self-centeredness. You're dead to trying to be your own God, and now you will submit to God being God because you believe he's better at it than you are. That's the essence of the Christian life. But I think we've lost sight of that. I want to recover that. But I believe we, 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 we've lost sight of that. When you see someone, typically in the church today, when you see someone who seems to be offering themselves as a living sacrifice, what we tend to think is, man, that person's on fire for the Lord. That person's anointed. But do we understand that's actually basic Christianity? Like that's the, that's the proper response to what God has done for us. All of us are called to live lives or offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. This is the essence of the Christian life. And the beautiful thing about God is when you offer your life as a living sacrifice to him, he gives you back a better one. In fact, Matthew 16, 25, you want to write it down? Jesus says, if anyone would come, no, no or a different one. Uh, Jesus says, if anyone seeks to save their life, they'll lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake will what? We'll find it. We'll gain it. The life that is truly life, the life that all of us long for, actually comes from surrendering, dying to ourselves, and offering ourselves holy and pleasing to God as a living sacrifice. It's crazy how that works. To walk, it's an upside down world, exactly. And so, because of this, because we are living sacrifices, go back to it if you don't mind, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. This is the byproduct of it now. When you live a life of a living sacrifice, you will be holy and pleasing to God. That's what God desires. You want to please God? You want to be holy? Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. And now we proceed to verse 2 because there's some more clarity now that Paul gives. Verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not. Everyone say do not. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Underline that in your notes. Offer yourself a living sacrifice. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. To conform to the pattern of this world is the opposite of what it means to be a living sacrifice. Those are contrasts. Those are two things that don't go together. And this is how this is connected to life in the spirit. Life in the Spirit or walking by the Spirit, we've been going through a series, if it's your first time here, we've been going through a series asking the question, okay, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit and how do we do that practically? And so to walk by the Spirit, in short, is to live according to your new nature and to remain in fellowship with your new master. So if you're a Christian, you have a new nature. God has given you his Spirit, which means inside of you there should be new inclinations And to walk by the Spirit is to live according to that new person that God made you to be. You're not living for yourself anymore. Now you're living for him. But there's this war within all of us that wants us to to, to not walk in the Spirit, but instead to walk in the flesh, meaning to live according to our old nature. So there's this internal turmoil that we experience every day. Do I live for myself or do I live for God? And when the Scripture says to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice— That's synonymous with walking in the Spirit. But when you conform to the pattern of this world, that's synonymous with walking in the flesh. It's not what we're called to do. When you walk in the flesh, you will conform to the pattern of this world. The Scripture says, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't what? Don't don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't think like the world thinks. Don't think like those who are disconnected from God think. Don't Act like those who are disconnected from God act. Don't dress like those who are disconnected from God dress. Don't value the things that are those, the things that are, don't value the things that those who are disconnected from God value. Don't love, don't adopt a lifestyle that's similar or reflective of those who are disconnected from God. And why? Because you're better? No. Because they're disconnected from God, why would you follow in the footsteps or adopt a lifestyle of a culture that is disconnected from God? And yet, and yet, 
removing self-righteousness, if we can just have a, a clear, candid conversation, the church tends to live just like the world. And this has been a habit of the church from its very inception. Uh, even before the, the uh, church in, in Acts, the people of God have tended to have this propensity to live according to the culture and patterns of those around them. The Israelites dealt with this. They would live just like the Canaanites, adopt the gods and adopt the values that the Canaanites or the, the, the people around them adopted. And we tend to have the same thing today. Thinking like the world thinks, valuing the things the world values, acting, believing the same things. I think in our culture, what tends to, to, to sort of influence this is we have these core beliefs or these core distinctives that we see as core to Christianity. But unbeknownst to us, uh, there's other ways that we adopt the values of culture. So what I mean by that is this, we, we, I think it's very common that in our culture, okay, I'm, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-marriage, and I affirm the Bible. And that's sort of the extent of my set-apartness, but unknowingly, I've adopted all the other norms and values of the fallen culture. And while pro-life, pro-marriage, affirming the Bible, all of that is wonderful and necessary, but if I can just tell you, that is not the extent of set-apartness that God desires for us. That's just not it. That's, that's like barely scratching the surface. To be a child of God is to experience this complete inward transformation, this pervasive newness where we're being transformed on the soul level, every aspect and every fire of our being, being to look and to live and to love like the very God that created you and has saved you. That's what it means to be a child of God. And so what's the disconnect? How, why do we tend to conform to the pattern of this world? And all of us have this propensity, amen? The church past and present has this propensity to lean towards conforming to the pattern of this world. And I think there's a lot of reasons why we could point to, but the reason I want to point to today is I think a lack of awareness. I think we tend to conform to the pattern of this world because of a lack of of awareness. Anybody go to the beach? Okay. Next time you go to the beach, I want to encourage you to watch the surfers or the boogie boarders or the swimmers. And what you're going to notice is that where they start out is not where they finish. As they're boogie boarding and as they're swimming, unbeknownst to them, they're drifting. They're drifting out to the sea or they're drifting down the shore and they have no clue. And there's this powerful current in the water that is pulling them. And part of what makes the current so powerful is that they don't know it. It's subtle, which gives it the ability to pull you further and further because you're not aware of it. And I think in the church, we tend to drift toward the pattern of this world because we're not aware. We fail to realize that we're in a real spiritual battle with a real spiritual opponent, and we get caught up in this spiritual drift, so to speak, getting pulled further and further away from the norms and values of our kingdom and further and further into the norms and values of the culture that we're supposed to be set apart from. And we're completely oblivious to it, which is why it's so powerful and so dangerous. And all the while, we're drifting and we're conforming and we're looking and living more and more like the fallen culture. And our lack of awareness, and probably our pride as well, all adds into this spiritual drift. But the second half of verse 2 gives us some insight into how to overcome this spiritual drift. Let's go back to it, please. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Circle that. Big circle. Probably the most important part of the day. Be transformed. Do not conform. Instead, be transformed. Now, the New Testament was written primarily in the Greek language. And so that word transformed in Greek is pronounced metaphao. Say metaphao. Okay. Metaphao literally means to be transfigured or transformed to become something completely new. I believe it's where you get the word metamorphosis from. And so the call of the Christian, biblical Christianity, is to undergo metamorphosis, 
to be transformed into something completely new, to become a completely new creation from the inside out. But I want to point out, I want to draw attention to what this transformation is rooted in. Go back to it, please. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of the mind. So the inward transformation of the Christian to live and to become Christ is directly connected to the transformation of the mind. Please don't miss this. If you're a new Christian or if you've been a Christian for 50 years and you think you're, don't miss this. The mind is connected to walking in the spirit and being a living sacrifice. So if you want to obey God, if you want to please him, if you want to fulfill your call as a Christian, central to that is your mind. Your mind is the space in the human where all of your thoughts and feelings and beliefs originate. It's different from your brain. Your brain is not your mind. Your brain is the organ in your body that regulates your body. In a similar way, I see it as your mind is what regulates your soul, so to speak. And it's deeply spiritual. It's deeply woven into the soul of a man or woman, and it's extremely powerful. In fact, your mind is so powerful, it's what influences what you feel and what you do and ultimately what you become. That's how powerful your mind is. Your mind influences what you feel, meaning your thoughts and your beliefs influence your emotions. You feel something because you believe something. For example, let's say that uh, there was this, this large 10-foot king cobra right in the middle of the sanctuary. What would happen? Exactly. Ah! Instantly, instantly, fear would overcome everyone. The ladies would be screaming. Probably a lot of the guys would just be walking out trying to pretend that they're not scared, but deeply like they're, they're experiencing this fear, right? You'd be scared. You'd feel the emotion of fear, and you wouldn't have to try to be afraid. You would just be afraid. It'd be an automatic response. But not everyone would feel that way. This is what's interesting. If I took a little baby and put the baby in this room, the baby wouldn't be afraid. So how is that? How could adults be running and screaming, but the baby actually probably would crawl up to the snake and probably grab it and put it in its mouth, right? So how is that possible? How could there be two different emotional responses? The mind. That's the difference. You believe that snake is going to harm you and possibly kill you, so you experience the emotion of fear. But that baby doesn't believe that. That baby doesn't have those thoughts. That baby thinks that snake is a toy. So that baby might be experiencing joy while you're experiencing fear. I'll give you another example. If my wife, if, if I came home today and my wife said, hey, we're going to Disneyland for a week, there'd be two different emotional responses, okay? My kids, they would feel feelings of excitement, joy, optimism, because they think Disneyland fun, Disneyland play, Disneyland excitement. I would feel different feelings because I have different thoughts. I would feel sadness. <laughs> I, feel, I feel fear because of my thoughts. I hear Disneyland and I think I'm in debt now. All right? I hear Disneyland, I think long lines. I think motion sickness. And so the same thing is experiencing deep, different feelings in all of us and that's how powerful your mind is. It influences what you feel. And this is what's dangerous about feelings as well. Listen, your mind is what influences your feelings. And, it, it, and it's based on what you believe to be true, not what is actually true. So what you believe to be true is what influences how you feel, not what's actually true. That's why you have to be able to understand what you're feeling and surrender that to God. This very thing is central to so many marital and relational issues. I think you did that on purpose, okay? And then that thought produces feelings. I feel angry. I feel bitter. And I feel, I think, I'm justified in it. That's how that works. But what if you didn't do that on purpose? 
What if that wasn't your intention by what you did? All those feelings and all those justifications that I have for feeling them are actually wrong and misguided. Oh, it's, it's, this is the center of so many relational issues. The teenage girl who thinks my parents and my daughters don't think this way, so don't come to them and tell them, I don't think they think this way, right? Well, let me say it in a minute. The teenager who thinks, oh, my parents are so unreasonable for not letting me date that guy that's 20 years older than me and stay out till 3 a.m. with him. I think they're so wrong and so foolish, and now I feel bitterness at them and feel resentment toward them, and I think I'm justified in it. But the reality is her parents or his parents aren't unreasonable. That guy isn't good for them. And the kid is actually the one that needs to repent of what they're thinking and what they're feeling. You see, you can't always trust what you feel. Even though that feeling might be real, the thought connected to it might actually be wrong. And that is the power of the mind. It influences what you think and what you feel and also what you do. This is not psychology. Secular psychology, this is deeply spiritual stuff. A lack of understanding of this is why we tend to not walk in the spirit. It's why we tend to settle for behavior modification because we don't understand the spiritual nature of emotions and the spiritual nature of the mind. Your mind influences what you do. I'll give you an example. One time I was at this uh, prestigious, this awards banquet and there was a lot of like prestigious people there. So everybody's wearing suits and ties, and the, and the women are wearing those elegant nightgowns. Is that sort of atmosphere. Oh. What what I say? What's a nightgown? Oh, it's pajamas? <laughs> That's funny. They're wearing evening gowns. Not PJs. <laughs> It wasn't a, wasn't a slumber party. <laughs> so they're wearing, you know, all those fancy clothes. And uh, the MC comes and he's, you know, he's doing his thing. And then he says they're going to be giving out a bunch of awards. And he goes through all the different awards. And he comes to some award, something like most reliable or most able to be counted on, something like that. And I thought to myself, oh, might, they, they might give that to me. So he goes through his thing, says all his other words, and he finally comes to the one that I think I might get. And so I sort of wake up and you know, start, start focusing. And he does that thing where they, they say the award, and then they announce the qualities of the person, and they say the name. And so he starts to do that very thing. And he says, you know, this person is always reliable. And I think to myself, well, you know, I, I'm pretty reliable. This person is always on time. I think to myself, I'm always on time. This person is a, a joy to be around. I'm like, oh, maybe. <laughs> ah. This person never calls in sick. At this point, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get this award. And so I start feeling things now. I feel proud because I'm going to be recognized for all my hard work. I, I feel validated because, because I'm going to get an award. But I also start to feel anxiety. I'm going to have to say a speech. So I start to mentally jot down notes. Okay, I need to make sure I thank this person and I need to show appreciation and I'm, I'm going through all this. And he comes to the name and he says, and the winner is, and I start to stand up and put a smile on my face and you know, raise my hand to be really gracious. And he says, Scooter Johnson. And I was like, <laughs> just sort of sat back down and, and tried to play it off, right? He said, some name with an S that sounded just like my name. What's the point? All those feelings I felt and actions I did all came from what I thought and believed. I thought I was going to get that award. I believed that, and it led me to feel feelings, and those feelings led me to do actions. That is the power of the mind. What you think is shaping what you feel, is shaping what you do, and in the kingdom of God, your mind also shapes what you become. You don't become by doing in God's kingdom. You come by believing. In fact, what's, what's interesting to me is that two of the words, probably the two primary words or two of the most primary words used in the Bible that connect us to God 
have to do with your mind, repentance and faith. Both those are central to your connection to God, and they have to do with your mind. Write down Matthew 4, verse 17. It's how central the mind is, how spiritual the mind is. This is when Jesus begins his earthly ministry. The very first statement that Jesus makes after he's baptized and he begins his ministry. Listen to what it says. From that time on, Jesus began to preach what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent. It's his first words. Write down Mark 6, verse 7. Mark 6, 7. This is when Jesus sends the 12 disciples out on their journey, on their mission, so to speak. From that time on, Jesus began, oh, excuse me, calling the 12 to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. Now skip ahead to verse 12. And they went out and preached that people should what? What does it say? Repent. Repentance, central to conversion. One more, write down Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is after Peter gives a sermon to, I think, 3,000 people-ish, and the Bible says that they're cut to the heart, and they say, okay, what do we do with what we've just heard? And this is what Peter says. Peter replied, what? Repent and be baptized. To me, the reason why repentance is so connected to conversion, so connected to faith, is repentance, true repentance, is an expression of faith. That's why. So if someone says, is repentance necessary to go to heaven? Yes, depending on how you define repentance. To repent, the word repentance literally means to change your mind or to transform your mind. The Greek word is metanoia. Say metanoia. That's the New Testament Greek word for repent. Meta, just like the, the transformed word, right? Metaphao, metanoia. So repentance is the transformation of the mind. And when you come to the faith, there's a transformation of your mind that has to happen. You stop believing that your righteousness makes you right with God, and you start believing that Christ's righteousness is what makes you right with God. It's repentance. It's an expression of faith. You stop believing that you can get there on your own, that your good works are going to make you right with God, and you start believing that Christ's work on the cross is what makes you right with God. Repentance is connected, deeply connected to faith. You no longer believe it's all about you, and you start believing that it's all about God. So in the kingdom of God, it's not about doing. That's not how you become. It's about believing. In fact, write, write, write down John 1, uh, 9 to 12. John 1, 9 to 12. I want you to look for the connection between belief and become. John 1, 9 to 12. It's talking about Jesus. John 1, 9 and 12, it says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world, Jesus. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Did you see the believing or did you see the becoming? To those who believed in what? In his name. For those believed in Jesus, he gave what? The right to what? To become. So believing in Jesus is directly correlated to becoming a child of God. You don't become a child of God by doing good stuff. You become a child of God by believing. That's connected to your mind. I'll give you one more. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Galatians 3, 26 this is going to be out of order, but I want you to look for the believing and look for the becoming. What you believe and what you become. All right, I want us to think here. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Did you see it? Yes or no? Okay. Becoming. What do you become? Children of God. Well, how do you become? Through faith, through believing. And so in God's kingdom, what you believe is what you become. That's how central the mind is. And now listen, that is why, in my eyes, the majority of spiritual warfare takes place in the mind. Your mind is the soil 
where the majority of spiritual warfare aimed at pulling you from Christ is going to take place. If the enemy can just influence your mind, if he can get you to think wrong, he can get you to live wrong. If he can get you to miss the mark in your thinking, he will get you to miss the mark in your living, the mind, deeply spiritual. So let's recap for a minute. The mind is, the mind regulates the soul. It's, it's deeply spiritual, extremely powerful because the mind is what affects what you feel, what you do, and what you become. And because of that, it's the primary place where Satan tends to wage spiritual warfare against us. Because if he can get us to think wrong, he can get us to live wrong. So in light of that, in light of how deeply spiritual the mind is, what are we supposed to do now? Write it down. Renew your mind. That's what you got to do. Because of all that I just said, you have to renew your mind. Not listen to a sermon. You have to renew your mind. Not just do your quiet time and get that. No. You have to. If you're going to be a living sacrifice, you have to renew your mind. Go back to verse 2, please. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will, able, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Notice, the mind is connected to being transformed, and the mind is connected to being conformed to the pattern of this world. So whichever way you go, that's going to be determined by what is influencing and forming your mind. You get that? So if the world is what is forming your mind, you will conform to the pattern of this world. That's just how that works. If the world is shaping what you believe, if the world is forming your thought life, you will live and look like the world. So we as believers have to be aware, aware of what is shaping our mind. There's a few avenues in our culture that are sort of primary agents that shape our mind. One, if you want to write down, one is education. Education is one of the primary mind formative things in our culture, which is why for me, I'm becoming more and more of an advocate of Christ-centered education. I am, I'm all in on Christ-centered education. By the way, my kids went to public school last year. So I'm not, I haven't homeschooled for their whole duration and private school the whole, the whole time. I'm not, it's not about private school either. It's about Christ-centered education. You can homeschool and not have Christ-centered education. You can go to private school and have not Christ-centered education. You can go to a Christian school and not have Christ-centered education. I'm talking about Christ-centered education. That's what I'm a big advocate for. And, and I have to just alert you, my reason is different from the typical reason. Usually, and I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing, but usually somebody talks about Christian education or Christ-centered education, their reasoning behind it is the sex revolution or sex ethics and, and the agenda that's being pushed in the schools. That's not my concern. It's good. I mean, it's not good. It's, it's, it's not good, but I, my reasoning is far deeper than that, personally. To me, all the things you learn in school, History, mathematics, psychology, physical education, all that stuff. Secular education extracts God from all of that. And so what happens is you see history as God extracted, and mathematics as God extracted, and physical education as God extracted, and language as God extracted. But the problem is all those things, God is not extracted. God is, they actually point to God. And so when, you are, when your mind is formed by that, you, you, you tend not to see the centrality of God. You don't see God as the one who all things were created by and for and in whom all things hold together. And what happens is your mind is formed by that sort of education. You see God as over here, one of many things. And so now your faith becomes segmented. And this is why, if I'm just giving opinions now, this is one of the reasons why people go to college and what do they do? They walk away from the faith. Well, why? Well, because God was never central. Their, their mind never saw God as central to life. They didn't see God in math. They didn't see God in marriage. They didn't see God in everything. They saw God as Sunday. 
from 10 to 11, and maybe a prayer before a meal, and maybe youth group on Sunday, Wednesday night at, from 7 to 9.30, but they didn't see God as central, and now they're just living out what their mind has been formed. Just my opinions. Now, does that mean that if your kid goes to public school, you're doing an awful job, or they're going to hell? No. Does it mean if you were one to public school, you're going to hell? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Listen, please, my point is not to make you afraid or feel condemnation. It's simply to make you aware. That's all. To make you aware. And then with that awareness comes an empowerment. You have to be aware of how your mind is being formed so that if you do go to public school as a parent, you're extra diligent in helping your kids understand the centrality of God to counterbalance some of that because their mind is being formed contrary and so in your discipleship of your child, you help them see God as central to counterbalance what's, what's going on in the, in, the, in the school system. Is that making sense? So it's not about fear. Say it's not about fear. Say it's not about condemnation. It's about awareness. Say it's about awareness. It's about awareness. You need to be aware of how education shapes your mind. A second agent of formation of the mind is, your, is, is uh, the media. The media. Entertainment. Are you aware of how much your mind has been formed by the things you consume for entertainment? Are you aware of how much of your ideas on romance and your ideas on marriage and your ideas on dating have been shaped by the cartoons you've grown up watching and the movies you've seen? And then people get into a relationship and there's this, this tension where they're expected to be like this, but it's actually like this and it doesn't work. So they say, ah, I must have been with the wrong person. Well, no, you're not aware of how your mind was formed by the culture of this, this world, and that's really what's going on. Do you realize by how, how many of what you think is acceptable to wear has actually been formed by people who are disconnected from God? Do you realize how what makes a man a man largely has been influenced by people who are disconnected from God? The media, the entertainment that we consume, deeply formative in our minds. Does it mean you can never watch a movie again? No, it's about awareness. Just want to make you aware. Because if you're not aware, you're more likely to drift, spiritually drift like those boogie boarders and like those swimmers in the ocean. You've got to understand the reality of how things are shaping your mind. I've never met anyone who fills their mind with the things of this world, but who thinks like Christ. It just doesn't work like that. I've never met anyone who thinks like Jesus and consumes content produced by Satan. It doesn't work like that. So you have to understand what's forming your mind. So what are we supposed to do in light of everything we've heard? Here's your soul work for the week. Every week, I'm going to have some soul work for you to do. Because it's not about just being entertained and then going home unchanged. It's about hearing something and then, okay, how do we put this into practice practically? Three questions I want to encourage you to really meditate. Three things I want to encourage you to do this week. Write them down. Here's the first one. During the week, do some re reflection. Ask God to make known to you this, the answer to this question. What is forming my mind? What is forming my mind? God, make me aware of what has formed my mind and what is formed my mind. What music am I listening to? What content am I consuming on my phone, on the internet, on my TV? God, make me aware of what is forming my mind. You gotta have some, gotta have some courage to do this and some honesty to do this because what's gonna happen, this is a spiritual battle that's gonna go on, you're gonna begin to rationalize. Ah, no, yeah. You're going to be doing in your mind. But ask God, no, please make it clear, like, what's forming my mind? And the second thing to ask, write down, how is that impacting my thought life? What's forming my mind? How is it impacting my thought life? Is it leading me to think more like Christ or less like Christ? You're going to have to be honest. What am I watching? Is it leading me to think more like Christ, like, like Christ? What am I doing? Is it leading me to think more like Christ or less like Christ? And here's the difference. All of us have a different level of connection with God and different level of maturity and understanding. And so there's certain things that might be, that I, that are not healthy for me, that might be permissible for you. 
and vice versa. So this is why, this is where we have to have, you know, there's some liberty, but there's some honesty that has to happen as well, is that the things that are forming you in unhealthy ways might not be forming me in unhealthy ways. So you're going to have to do that, you know, between you and God stuff on that. What's forming my mind? How is it shaping my thought life? And the third thing, I want to encourage you to share your reflections with one other person in the church. It can be your spouse. It can be someone else. But I've, I've, I'm going to say this almost every week. You grow in community. So you don't grow just on your own. God placed you in a church not just to hear a sermon, but to actually process and become these things together. And as you share your reflections, who knows, it might strengthen you, but it might actually strengthen them and make them more aware. That's why we have an obligation to share these things. I shouldn't say obligation. There's a real opportunity for us to share these things with one another. And I'm telling you, I, 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 I've become so much more, I still have a way to go, I've become so much more aware of how my mind has been shaped. And if I could go back and do one thing different in life, a, a lament I have, I wish I would have been more aware of how my mind was being formed and how it was going to impact my life. The music I listened to had no clue how many years it would take to undo some of the thoughts and some of the beliefs that I held solely from the music I listened to. And not everything's negative. Some things can be neutral or, 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 or both positive and negative. Sports, whether you realize it, if you're deeply involved in sports, it's shaping your mind, whether you realize it or not. I realized maybe over the past couple years how central sports shaped me. So, for example, I value responsibility. I value accountability. I have a strong passion for that, but that's very important to me. Where did I get that from? Well, I got it from home, but I also deeply got it from sports. In sports, you are to be accountable. You're supposed to be responsible in sports. And so I've carried that with me. Now, it just so happens that, that I think that value in sports is consistent with a value of the kingdom. Praise God for that. But there's also some values in sports that aren't values of the kingdom that I've become more aware of. One is vulnerability. Sports does not value vulnerability. Okay? If your feelings are hurt, who cares? It just doesn't matter. If you are hurt, it just doesn't matter. You have to go win. So that's a value in sports, but that's not a value in the kingdom of God. Actually, it's through vulnerability that you grow and you become and you encourage others. And so it wasn't until I was aware of, wow, sports has shaped me in this way, and that's actually contradictory to the kingdom of God, that I began to release that and overcome that. But what's the point of me sharing that? Everything is forming you, but you have to be aware. Because once you're aware, now you can surrender. And once again, we come to those two practices I've been saying the whole time of walking in the spirit. Awareness and surrender. Everyone say awareness. Everyone say surrender. Central to walking by the spirit. So, as we close, the mind is central to the soul. It shapes how you feel, what you think, what you become. Because of that, the mind is the soil where much spiritual battle, spiritual warfare takes place. If Satan can get you to miss the mark in your thinking, he gets you to miss the mark in your living. Therefore, we have to renew our minds. And that starts with becoming aware of what is shaping our minds. That's what we're going to focus on this week. And as we become aware, we have to do the work of, the, the, the continued work of renewing. And how do you actually renew the mind? We're going to unpack that over the next several weeks. But we got enough to work on this week. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for uh, this moment. Thank you for your mercy. What a beautiful thing. Help us to grasp the mercy of God more. That in Christ we have a fresh start daily. The sins we've committed, the mistakes we've made, the dumb stuff we've done, the dumb stuff we continue to do, in Christ we have a reset button every day. Oh, help us to appreciate that. Help us to grasp the beauty of your mercy. And then help us to respond in the only appropriate way. 
which is to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. Teach us what it means to walk by the Spirit, to live lives of living sacrifices. Help us to understand how our minds are connected to this, how central our mind is to this, how our mind affects what we feel and what we think and what we do and what we become. And this week, as we reflect, please help us become more aware of what is forming our minds, not for condemnation, not for guilt, not for shame, but rather for empowerment. If we become aware of what's forming our mind, then we can surrender that to you. We have to do this tough work if we're going to grow. So please give us the grace to identify these things. Please give us the humility to acknowledge these things and the grace to surrender it to you, God, because we don't want to be a people who are professional Christians. It's not what we want. We want to grow. We want to be conformed into the image of Christ. We want to think like Christ and value the things that Christ values. So help us, God. Help us. Please bless our efforts this week because our efforts mean nothing apart from your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Make us living sacrifices in Jesus' name. All God's people said together. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and give the Lord some praise.